Hello, and welcome to Bedtime Stories. My name is Frank Padour, and I'll be reading to you a Grimm Brothers fairy tale entitled The Language of Animals. In times of old, there once lived a king whose wisdom was so great that the whole land depended upon his judgments. Nothing remained long unknown to him. It appeared as if intelligence of the most carefully concealed event was carried to him through the air. It was the custom of the king each day at noon, when the dinner had been removed and no one else present, for the trustworthy servant to bring in a large bowl which was always covered up. Neither the servant nor anyone else knew what it contained, for the king never took off the cover to eat of the contents till he was quite alone. This had continued for a long time, but there came a day when the curiosity of the servant was too strong to be overcome, and after removing the dish from the king's table, he took it to his own room. After carefully locking the door, he lifted up the cover, and saw to his surprise a white snake lying at full length in the dish. He no sooner caught sight of it than he became unable to resist a desire to taste, so he cut a little piece off and put it in his mouth. Scarcely had it touched his tongue, then he heard outside his window strange whisperings and soft voices. He went and listened, and then noticed two sparrows who were talking together and relating to each other all they had seen in the woods and fields. The little piece of snake which he had so enjoyed had given him the power to understand the language of animals. Now it happened that on this very day, the queen had lost one of her beautiful rings, and she suspected that this trustworthy servant had stolen it because he, above all others, had most access to the room in which she had left it. The king sent for him, and with harsh, angry words, told him he should be brought to justice and punished for a deed which till that moment he had never heard of. It was of no use for him to protest his innocence. The king was inexorable. In his sorrow and distress of mind, he went out into the court behind the castle and tried to think of some means by which he might get himself out of this trouble. On the smooth surface water of the lake, two ducks were swimming peacefully together, side by side. They plumbed their shining feathers with their smooth bills while they held a very confidential conversation. The servants stood still to listen and heard them talking of where they had been waddling and of the good food they had found. Ah, yes, said one, but some of it lies very heavy on my stomach. I think it must be that ring which lay under the queen's window. In my hurry, I dare say I swallowed it. The servant no sooner heard this than he seized the duck by the neck and, carrying her into the kitchen, said to the cook, Kill this duck for dinner, will you? It is quite fat. Yes, I see it is, replied the cook, taking it in his hand. I shall not have the trouble of fattening this one, at all events, or waiting till it is ready. Then he put an end to the poor duck's life, and on opening it to prepare for roasting, he found the queen's ring in her stomach. The servant was overjoyed when he saw the ring, for now he could easily prove his innocence to the king, who was very anxious to make amends for having so unjustly accused him. He not only gave him his friendship, but also promised him whatever high position in the court he wished. The servant readily accepted an office in which he could have a horse and money to travel, for he had a great desire to see the world and visit the different towns of which he had heard. All his requests were granted, and he very speedily set out on his travels. At the end of a few days he came to a pond in which he saw three fish which had been caught by the rushes on the bank and were gasping for want of water. Although people say that fish are dumb, yet he understood the complaining tones well enough to know that without help they would quickly perish. He sympathized from his heart with their suffering. So he alighted from his horse and, rescuing the little fish from the rushes, placed them again in the water. They wriggled about with joy, and one of them stretched out his head and cried, We will always think of thee, and thou wilt be rewarded for having saved us. He rode away, however, and presently beneath his feet a voice spoke, and he understood that the words were those of an ant king murmuring over the danger to his community. These human beings, he said, 
ride by on awkward animals without the least thought. Here's a stupid horse coming along. No doubt, with his heavy hooves, he will tread down our people unmercifully. But the rider turned his horse aside, and the ant king cried out, I will often think of thee, and thou shalt be rewarded. Then the king's messenger traveled on till he reached a wood, and there he saw two ravens, a father and mother, and heard them say, as they stood by their nest, Go along with you, we cannot feed you any more. You are fat enough, and must now provide for yourselves. And the old birds threw the young ones out of the nest as they spoke. The poor little birds lay on the ground, fluttering and beating their little wings and crying, Oh, we poor helpless children, we have to provide for ourselves, and we cannot even fly. There is nothing left for us but to die of hunger. Then the good young man dismounted, killed his horse with his dagger, and left it there for the young ravens to feed on. They hopped upon it and began to feast themselves, crying out, We will always think of thee, and thou shalt be rewarded. He was now obliged to use his own legs instead of riding, so he walked on for a long distance, till at last he came to a large town. There was a great noise in the streets, and crowds of people, and presently a man on horseback rode up and made a proclamation that the king's daughter was seeking a spouse, but that he who was a candidate for her hand must first perform completely a very difficult task, and if he undertook it and did not succeed, he would forfeit his life. The young man had at first no wish to be a suitor to such a great lady, but he had no sooner seen the young princess than he became quite dazzled with her beauty and promised to do everything she wished. Then he was admitted by the king as her suitor and sailed very soon after on a voyage to enable him to accomplish the undertaking she required. One day, as he was seated on deck, he saw a gold ring fall before him as if thrown by a hand. He took great care of it, and on his return gave it to the king, who at once ordered him to throw the ring back into the sea and dive after it, adding, Every time you come up without it, you shall be thrust back into the waves till they overwhelm you. Everyone pitied the handsome youth who was required to perform such a difficult task. He went back to the sea, and while standing more fully on the shore, he saw three fish swimming about, and they proved to be none other than those whose lives he had saved. One of them held a mussel in its mouth, and swimming to the shore, laid it on the strand at the young man's feet. He took up the mussel and opened it, and there lay the gold ring. Full of joy, he carried it to the king, and expected that the promised reward would be granted him. But the king's proud daughter said disdainfully, that she understood her suitor was not so well born as herself, and therefore he must have another difficult task to perform before she could consent to marry him. So she went out herself into the garden and scattered ten sacks full of grain over the grass. Then she called her lover and showed him what she had done, saying, These grains must all be separated from the grass before the sun rises tomorrow morning, not the smallest grain must be overlooked. She left him after those words, and the poor man seated himself in the garden and thought that for him to perform such a task as this would be impossible. So he sat still in sorrowful expectation that the break of day would be the hour of his death. But when the first sunbeam fell in the garden, he saw with surprise the ten stacks of grain standing quite full near each other, and not the smallest grain left behind in the grass. The ant king had arrived during the night with thousands from his ant kingdom, and the grateful creatures had with great industry picked up every tiny grain and filled the sacks. At sunrise, the king's daughter came herself into the garden and saw with wonder that the young man had in every way performed the allotted task but she could not even now conquer the pride of her heart, and therefore she said, It is true he has accomplished two difficult tasks, but I require one more. He shall be my husband when he brings me an apple from the tree of life. The young man knew not even where this wonderful tree grew, but he was determined to make an effort to find it, so he set out to walk as far as his legs could carry him, but he had very little hope of success. 
He had traveled day after day through three kingdoms without success, when one evening he wandered into a wood and, feeling very tired, laid himself down under a tree to rest. Presently, in the branches, he heard a chattering of birds in a nest, and a golden apple fell down into his hand. Immediately, three young ravens flew down to him, perched themselves on his knee, and said, We are the three young ravens which you saved from being starved to death with hunger. As soon as we were grown large and strong enough to fly, we took our flight to distant countries and heard that you were in search of a golden apple. So we have traveled over the sea, even to the end of the world where the tree of life grows, and have brought away an apple for you. Full of joy, the young man forgot his fatigue, and returning quickly placed before the beautiful princess the golden apple. She had not now another word to say in opposition to their marriage. They divided the golden apple between them and ate it together. Then was the heart of the princess softened and filled with love for the brave youth, and they lived in uninterrupted happiness to a good old age. That was a Grimm Brothers fairy tale entitled The Language of Animals. Thank you for listening. Good night and sweet dreams.